Hello and welcome to our CSA live webinar today. It's great to have you here online today with us and we have nearly 300 registrations for our live webinar today. Thank you for your interest and uh, thank you for being online with us and we're looking forward to the webinar with Marcel and Elle today and the topic is domain reputation which metrics really matters. I'm happy to um, announced that my colleague Sebastian is also part of the moderation today. He's the technical lead for the CSA and I'm responsible for the uh, marketing and events. Hi Sebastian, we can see you now, that's great. <laughs> so um, yeah, maybe you know the CSA or not, just let me say I think you should know the CSA. Our goal is to increase the quality of commercial emailing. We act as a neutral interface between mailbox providers and senders of commercial emails, and we establish legal and technical quality standards, of course, in cooperation with our partners and certified senders. And all these steps ends in our CSA certification that we offer for ESPs and brands. So if you have, want to have more information about our services and how we can help you to support your business, just contact us after the webinar and we will get back to you and give you more information about us. And we have two official partners. The first one is Harlan and the second one is Dimashin. Thank you both for supporting us during the year, doing the live webinars. Thanks a lot. And if you want to have more information about Harlan or Dimashin, you can find our sponsoring sponsoring booklet in the download section it might be on the right on your screen and then you can find the contact information and contact them directly and find everything you need to know about um, Harlan and Demartian. And of course we have housekeeping rules for today. Um, please know that you're new to doing the world webinar and um, we have two different options for you today. Of course you can ask your questions by using the chat and submit them to organizer and we will collect all the questions in the background. And the second one is, um, you can use the function, raise your hand and ask the questions live. And of course, we would be glad if you use this function. Don't be shy, ask your question, get in conversation with our speakers or with Sebastian and me. But um, yeah, it's up to you how you want to use um, the function and ask your question. And we have a challenge for you. We want to know your key learning, your key facts, or everything you learned during our webinar today. Um, you can share it via social media, just tag us and use the hashtag CSA Live Webinars or use the chat and submit them to us and uh, we will collect it also in the background and share it with you at the end in the Q&A session. And um, at this point, I will hand over to Elle who starts the presentation. And you will hear me and see me at the end of the session again. And I'm here in the background and yeah, we can see Elle. That's good. So yeah, I switch to you and then you can start. See you later. That's great. Hi everybody, <laughs> Al Iverson here. Um, let's see, let's show my screen. Don't you love how everybody says, can you see my screen? Good yeah. morning, everybody. Here we are uh, embarking on this discussion of domain reputation. Who are we? I'm Al Iverson. I'm Director of Deliverability Products and Services for a company called Kickbox here in the US doing cool deliverability tool related stuff, along with my colleague, Marcel at, uh, in, uh, at Yahoo. Marcel, you want to say hi? Hi. <laughs> good morning, good evening, wherever you are. For me, it's good morning. Um, I'm still enjoying my coffee. LL, hi L. <laughs> nice to be doing this with you. Um, I'm responsible for uh, anti-spam, anti-abuse, security, 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 and privacy. It's still early for me. Um, over at Yahoo, uh, we serve consumer mailboxes for the Yahoo brand as well as the AOL brand and uh, some partners like Verizon and others. And um, I would just dive right in uh, what we want to do today. Basically, you thought um, everybody's always interested in, you know, learning more about deliverability. So uh, we're doing this. Um, also, everybody is always interested to learn more about engagement tracking. So we will talk about that too. And then last but not least, uh, Apple MPP. Who doesn't want to know about that, right? Um, 
Now you probably ask yourself, um, hold on, right? The session was called domain reputation. And uh, here we are, and we tell you, we want to talk about deliverability, engagement tracking, and Apple NPP. Um, and that's right. Uh, all of these are really important, especially when we talk about domain reputation or domain reputation really has an impact on all of these. And we want to touch on all of these separately. Uh, but first, we really want to uh, talk about why uh, this is important and why domain reputation um, or any reputation really, and we would touch on that too, um, is so important and why we on the receiving side really care about this. At the end of the day, what we want is we want to make our users happy. And I keep saying that, but it's worth reiterating. We really want to make sure that our users really just get the emails they want in their inbox, and we want to keep all the crap out. But there's a huge challenge in doing that because everybody's trying to compete with that inbox of our users um, and not necessarily sending things our users want. And um, I believe, Elle, you will touch a little bit on, you know, why that is and what's happened in the past with keeping these uh, bad actors out. Yeah, I, I thought it was, um, as we talk about where we're going, where we are today and where spam filtering and best practices are going in the future, I thought it would be helpful to talk about where we've come from. Um, so I resurrected a really old slide that I do believe uh, a colleague at Pivotal Veracity, if you remember them from 100 years ago, uh, I believe she originally put this together, our version of this. Um, but it highlights it, you know, the sort of the eras of spam filtering. You know, starting out from the Wild West when people, there was this brief period where people could basically do whatever they want and there was a little coordination and a little consideration to reputation at a broad level. Um, you know, there were some spam filtering happening at that time. I was a part of a group called the Mail Abuse Prevention System that was one of the groups doing that. But it, it, that was sort of the start. It was it was the Wild West. It was the Old West. It hasn't really... Uh, it hadn't really developed into anything sort of coordinated or broadly spread. You know, and as that developed, we led to things like whitelisting and simple filtering at the IP reputation level, blocking IPs for doing bad stuff. But it's very reactive and very manual. But that sort of developed into a practice based on IP reputation that we all know and love. Um, we're looking at the indicators that feed into reputational statistics for a sending IP address. Uh, it was primarily the negative stuff there, right? The, the bounces, complaints, feedback loop reports, and so forth. Starting the automation of that kind of stuff, starting to, you know, very simple robots that roll up that data and handle some of the sort of the grunt work of uh, spam filtering at the ISP level. Um, the evolution of that is more or less where we are today, right? We're, we're going to talk more about domain reputation, where that is, what the components of that are today. Um, but the other parts of it are engagement and user interactions or, or positive feedback uh, uh, signals. And there's lots of, you know, AI and, and machine learning systems involved, right? Because it, it's, it's, a, it's a question of correlating a whole bunch of data. So it's really uh, systems that can handle big data to try to synthesize sort of reputation and best practice filtering across the ecosystem for any sort of big provider, whether that be Yahoo or Microsoft or, or Google's Gmail. Um, but taking that to the next level, right? Every, every day somebody asked me, did the filters at Yahoo or, or Gmail change recently? And no matter if you asked me that today or yesterday or a year ago, the answer is yes, because ISPs are getting better and their filters are improving every day, all the time. Every time they make a change, it's to um, improve their filters in an incremental fashion that makes things better for their subscribers. And that's what I, uh, that's what I'm thinking of when I talk about the incremental rising tide. It's a case where edge cases used to work in the past. I used to be able to do this just fine five years ago. Why did it stop working? We, we never had these problems before. And that is because spam filters are getting better and people that were closer to the edge of having a problem are now finding themselves on the wrong line of that problem you know and keep in mind this is all not even targeted at your typical marketer per se i mean certainly some of it is and there's a component there related to best practices for marketing mail but what they're really trying to do is stop the onslaught of really really horrible stuff 
And, and that can be very difficult to do. And so it, keep in mind that most of the filters that you're gonna run afoul of, if you run afoul of any, it, it's not to punish somebody for being a marketer, it's to try to keep the bad stuff out of people's mailboxes that consumers don't want, that's insecure, it could be phishing, spoofing, and other really unhappy stuff. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you already mentioned it, right? <clears throat> so I, I won't get tired of showing this slide, and I've shown this in the past, but really, as you just said, this is what it looks like typically to us. I'm exaggerating a bit, but um, I really want to repeat like 90%, 90 of all the traffic we get is malicious and bad, and we do not deliver to the inbox. Um, and it's really only the 10%, which our users probably want. Um, but we really have no way of knowing. Um, <clears throat> there's nothing which tells us, uh, look, this email you're sending is really something all the users want uh, that doesn't really exist. Um, and you know, the bad guys, they constantly try um, to get into the inbox. They constantly change their tactics. And as Al said, we constantly have to adjust and tweak. And that's why, yes, when somebody asked me, you know, have you guys changed the filters? I'm said, the answer is, yeah, of course, <laughs> constantly. Uh, because these guys on the other side, the bad guys, they they also change the tactics, right? And um, world events are being uh, um, leveraged, I would say, in, in, in trying to abuse and scam our users as well, right? We have the, the war in the Ukraine, uh, and there are lots of people who are trying to benefit from that um, by sending fake donation emails and things like that. So we have to adjust for that. Um, and one of the problems we're really having is that um, everybody you know, looks the same and we don't really know uh, who you are when you first send us an email, right? It, I mean, best case, everything is neutral. Um, and we have no way of knowing, like I said, whether the user actually asked for the email. Um, we can only infer permission or consent based on the absence of certain negative signals or based on the existence of hopefully positive signals, right? And that really leads to all the things we want to discuss. That really leads to um, the question of engagement and why this is so important, right? And we have started employing some of these things on our side, and certainly we're not the only one. And El, you can talk a little bit about your experience with uh, Gmail. Yeah, and, you know, in in sort of response to all the challenges that we just talked about, if you look at the Gmail ecosystem, now keep in mind, I am not speaking on behalf of Gmail. I'm speaking as my, with my from my expertise as a deliverability consultant over these past uh, few years. Um, but what I see here is that in response to all of those challenges, Gmail has really heavily weighted their spam filtering to look for positive indicators, positive feedback. That's what I mean by the rise of engagement. So you have this whole, the, the whole deliverability ecosystem, the best practices consulting, what's, you know, what we tell people to do. If, if there is a bullet point guidance for Gmail deliverability success, it is improve your engagement, make sure you're sending mail that people are heavily, are, are, are very likely to heavily respond to, very likely to heavily engage with, um, which, you know, as we're going to talk about, um, Apple's model with Apple mail privacy protection kind of blows that up and they're kind of conflicting models. And so how do you reconcile that? And that's what kind of brings us back to some of these core best practices with the uh, with authentication uh, and you know DMARC and all of the stuff that we're going to talk about more, that that's sort of the core that some people are sort of forgetting because they looked at sort of the happy shiny um, engagement for so long. But now that some of that is being peeled away, we got to focus on these basics underneath that are very important. Yeah, and some of these basics, else was mentioned, um, you know, DMARC and and, and, and others. Um, why do we need that, right? So like I said, we have no way of knowing who you are when you come in and you send your email for the first time. And one of the first steps you need to do is to authenticate your email. Um, that feeds into you know, the main reputation and everything else. Um, we cannot infer any reputation or any positive signals really and tie them back to the sender unless you actually authenticate your email. 
and it's uh, 2022, and we're still seeing a lot of senders who don't do that. Um, but we really, we really want you to implement that because maybe you know, in 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 the not so distant future, we will probably look at this problem again and say, hey. You really, really need you to authenticate your email. Otherwise, we will treat you completely different than if you do not. Um, and it doesn't really solve the the good versus bad part, right? Um, it you also it doesn't also mean that you know you're necessarily telling us the truth uh, because the bad guys are authenticating their email as well. But it is a very first and important step for us to really be able to distinguish between certain senders and then everything else we can tie back to that authentication. Uh, and really what this really means is uh, follow these best practices, which uh, a lot of others already talked about over the years. We certainly have talked about uh, that um, L and myself um, at various um, outlets and um, sessions. And it really means, you know, at the very least do DCAM um, you know, we can debate about SPF uh, and ideally, you know, leverage DMARC as well, because it really, really helps not just us to identify you and you authenticate your email, but DMARC especially also helps you um, to protect your brand and subsequently our mutual customers. And uh, we see some really nice, um, you know, progress there. Maybe, Al, you want to share a little bit about what you see there in the industry? Yeah, so it's it's great to see. Uh, actually, it's both wonderful and kind of embarrassing to see this data presented this way, uh, because if you look at you know how many domains are there that are active in the world at any given time, it's probably upwards of 25 to, to 50 million that are actually sending mail. So on the one hand, we've got close to 5 million of those domains that are actively uh, engaged and they've actively implemented DMARC, which is wonderful. Uh, but we still got a long way to go and uh, to get sort of to a critical mass. It's taken a while. It's, you know, we think about when did we first start trying to encourage uh, in usage of DMARC and we're, that's what, 2012, 2013? It's been a good long while now, but it's growing, but it's still, there's still a gap here. And not everybody knows that it's basically a necessity and a very important thing to implement today. Yeah, and I believe you're actually celebrating like 10 years of DMARC, as you said, 20, uh, 2012. Um, and yeah, these are some numbers from our side, right? When we really look at DMARC by messages, you know, one could think, great, everything is peachy, right? 75% of all the emails we receive are protected by DMARC. Um, and that's true. But then when we really look at the number of senders versus the number of messages, uh, that is a completely different picture. There's a very long tail of senders who do not protect their emails or, or their brands using DMARC. So uh, we still have a long way to go. And just because you know the the number or most messages are protected doesn't mean that the messages and the brands who actually need protection are protected, right? It just means that obviously some large volume senders, and we all know who they are, you know, when we look at Amazon and others, um, they are protected, but you know, certain banks they don't send a lot of volume, and there are a lot lots of them out there. Schools um, and some other critical uh, emails, there are certainly not, but they should be. Um, and and really, ideally, everybody should adopt that because at the end of the day, um, adopting that technology and, and and helping each other, and not just us on the receiving side, but really the brands. Um, and the ESPs are really asked to actually do that, right? Go to your clients, go to your uh, um, customers and tell them why they need to do that. And I know it's hard sometimes because they will come back and says, say, well, you know, what's the benefit? What's the ROI? Why do I need to do that? I'm still reaching my customers. Um, but it really helps us in the industry uh, to raise the bar, to increase or solidify the foundation of emails because everything else um, which comes after that is really, really important. And it is based on uh, that authentication, that foundational piece. Because when we really think about it, um, once, like I said, once we know who we are, once you authenticate your email, we can really create kind of like a fingerprint. We can know um, and identify you across the board, uh, 
all the sick notes, all the little um, you know properties you might include in your email become really, really important, right? So obviously the, the title is domain reputation, but when you really break this down, you look at everything in your email, your sending domain, your IP certainly, the URLs you put into your email, um, links, uh, you know, from address, everything is important. And whenever our users interact with various bits and pieces within your email, um, you know, be it positive, be it negative, that will inform the reputation of that element across the board. Um, and, you know, in that vein, maybe I'll, maybe we should talk about alignment, right? I mean, we talk about the alignment in the context of DMARC, but uh, in a way, you know, if, if you claim to be brand X, and I think as a brand, you spend all the time and energy to look consistent in your offline communication or in your professional online communication. And then in some cases, we see the emails some of these brands are sending, uh, and that doesn't really match what you do elsewhere and all the time and energy and money you spend on your uh, brand representation elsewhere. Um, maybe you should do that in your emails as well. And should we should we align everything within the email? Uh, what's your what's your idea and what's your thought there? Yeah, I mean, uh, alignment is the devil in the details when it comes to properly uh, implementing authentication and DMARC in particular, right? The, the whole point of alignment is making sure that the authentication signals connect to or in other words align with the visible from domain you're putting out there and that means it's the end of the road for cousin domains look like domains using a generic domain from your esp or crm platform dns is is cheap there's no excuse to not have your own domain and have it roll up to you we're going to talk more about you know shared domain limitations here in a little bit but there's there's really no reason it's not like a shared ip address you have to send a million messages to be able to have your own domain so, and that's where alignment comes into play. That's the specifics of alignment. What is alignment in a nutshell? It's connecting authentication to the visible from address, the friendly from what actually shows up to the consumer. There's there's hack workarounds that you implement for some stuff. Some of that stuff was, there was technical reasons why it might've been necessary in the past, but the future is alignment. Yeah, and then once you have done that, Right on our side, basically, when all our users interact with that, um, those are really sick notes to us to let us know what do people think about that that specific email, that specific sender. Once you authenticate it, <clears throat> like I said before, when you first start sending email, we don't know who you are. Right, um, you have to build up that reputation. Um, and sure, yes, we do use positive signals, but I believe there's this misconception um, out there that these positive signals uh, are really, really important, right? We have seen this uh, when we discuss Apple MPP in the industry, everybody seems to be, or not everybody, but a lot of people seem to be freaking out because now they think they lose insight into those positive signals on the sending side. And yes, they are important in, in, in certain contexts. Um, people also think uh, because of Apple MPP, we on the receiving side, we lose uh, insight into how users engage with email. And that's certainly not true because we, we, A, we don't see what Apple's doing on their devices, we on the receiving side. And we also don't care because we can actually see what users do with our email. Um, but I would say what's even more important to us and in the context of domain reputation or reputation in general are really negative signals, right? Those are the strongest indicators to us and they should be the strongest indicators to senders as well that, A, the email you're sending to us, uh, you know, whatever you might claim, whatever you might think, uh, whatever you might infer, if our users tell us they don't want it, then they don't want it. And then we will do everything we can, or we should be doing everything our users are asking us to do to stop that email from getting to uh, uh, our users' inboxes. And at the same time, right, we also want to protect them, not just from not getting these emails they don't want, but we also want to protect our users from other things which might exist within the email. Um, and that certainly ranges from 
uh, malicious content attached to email, malicious content hosted somewhere behind an URL. You know, it goes back to uh, URL reputation and things like that. Uh, but also certainly from data being collected about them by parties, um, <clears throat> those uh, those users are not aware of, right? Uh, I keep saying when users open an email, when we ask our users when they read an email, uh, do they expect to be uh, tracked or that the sender understands and knows when uh, they open the email, where they open the email, how often they open the email? They would say, hell no, right? And that's certainly why uh, we do certain things. Uh, we proxy all these tracking requests and image requests. Uh, Google is doing something similar. Um, and then Apple, obviously, they went to, um, to great length now, um, and everybody's talking about it, with their MPP program um, in order to protect customers, at least the ones who are using their Apple products. And uh, before we dive a little bit more into what Apple MPP is and how this affects everything we're talking about, maybe Al, you can explain uh, very quick, you know, how tracking or open rate tracking really works, because I think there is a lot of misconception out there still. Yeah, there's a gentleman named Marcel Becker that I've talked to before. Uh, he's told me many times that open tracking is not a person opening your email. Open tracking is a server interacting with a client. It could be bots or programs on either end. You don't know that's not directly correlative, correlative to a, a real user in a lot of instances. So keep in mind that there already was imperfection, significant imperfection when it comes to open tracking. Um, and everybody thinks that Apple is the new big thing to do this. It's, it's, it's not, it's just the latest in one of many things that impede this sort of tracking. What do you think, Marcel? Anything you'd add to that? Uh, no, and I think that's really important to understand, right? It's basically, you're, you're really just tracking the fact that something downloaded an image from your server. Can you correlate this, you know, under normal circumstances to a human being interacting with your content? Probably. Um, can you really say that, you know, L open this email on this device? No. I think we really have to move on from that and it will just get worse, so to speak. You know, Apple certainly <clears throat> just showed everybody that, you know, what, what you're seeing there is not true um, and others might follow. And uh, yeah, I'll dive a little bit more into what Apple is actually doing there, how this impacts open rates. And then we can tie it back to uh, domain reputation and everything we are seeing on the receiving side. Yeah, and that's a good transition into uh, the Apple MPP. Um, Apple's uh, mail privacy perfect, uh, per, uh, protection has been around, what, since September, last September, I think. Um, you know, it took a while to get some traction. It took a few months for everybody to upgrade to iOS uh, 15 or the latest version of uh, Mac OS Monterey that supports it. Um, and now, like I said, you know, there was already imperfections in open tracking, but now you have the, Apple has really rolled this out to the masses. This is um, so broadly implemented that, uh, that Apple uh, really put privacy in the forefront of email tracking and it significantly affects what marketers were trying to do before and impedes a lot of those efforts. Um, and it's important to keep in mind that the way Apple has implemented mail privacy protection is that it affects tracking of any subscriber who has the feature enabled, regardless of their mailbox provider. In other words, it doesn't just affect iCloud email addresses. If it's a Gmail address, uh, a Yahoo address, any ISP, Comcast address, anything that you're loading through the Apple mail client is gonna go through this proxy process. And as a result, your opens are likely to be uh, significantly overreported and inflated. But you know, it depends on your audience too. Um, and whoever owns Pac-Man, please don't sue me. Uh, but here is my own personal data. And in my case, you can see, um, I only about 18% of, of my subscriber base is reading spam resource emails through um, through, through Apple uh, mail privacy protection. But I, you know, again, it, what this really highlights is it depends on the audience. Now, if you look at Sparkle's data from just about a month ago, um, two months ago at this point, um, it shows way, way more of your typical B2C subscriber base um, is going to be behind Apple MPP. So it's really significantly impacting 
tracking opens for B2C subscribers. And here's and sort, also, sort of how I, yeah, go ahead. Just to ingest L, uh, inject uh, L as well is something also folks need to understand. And I think, it, you know, in some cases it's common sense, but um, <clears throat> when we look at that data, sometimes that's forgotten is that consumers or anybody really consuming email, uh, they're using multiple devices, right? Email is consumed across different um, devices, be it on the desktop, uh, be, it on, be, be it on their mobile devices. So um, whenever I see, you know, some fancy stats talking about um, email client market share or device market share, and especially now everybody's saying, okay, yeah, Apple, they have like 60%, 70% of the market share. I'm like, you really need to go back and actually look at the data again and really need to understand that people are using multiple devices. Just because you see an open on an iPhone doesn't mean that the user actually read that email on an iPhone. Again, it just means that iPhone downloaded the email. The user might very well be using something else to actually read and engage with that email. Back to you, Val. Yep, thank you, sir. Uh, so here's how I like to visualize how this changes uh, what people would have thought of as sort of open tracking statistics before that, right? You had this very specific pool that you were able to um, call your reported opens with the limitations that Marcel and I talked about before. But now that number just reports way higher. It, uh, it you know, reports, because it's all proxied, it's all through Apple, Apple's firing off, in other words, loading that image before it ever um, gets to the inbox, or would rather with no correlation of whether or not it got to the inbox of a specific user at a specific time. That's the key there, that you can't tell if they open, when they open, any sort of that thing at all. Um, the only thing that you can sort of get out of this data for if you're a marketer that, that still has some sort of relative accuracy, it's a little bit of no activity, sort of airspace, air gap above the false positives there. That, relatively speaking, that is people who are, are not engaging. You know, there's nobody home or they're, they're not actively looking at your emails. You know, again, with the limitations around open tracking in general. But that's sort of the last bucket standing as far as if you're if you still have to suppress unengage from a deliverability perspective to try to fix an inbox placement issue, that that bucket still exists for you to do that. It's not going to be all your unengaged, um, but it's going to have a significant chunk of them, and there's probably still some value there from the perspective of trying to help improve your reputation with the spam folder issue, for example. Um, the other thing I want to highlight here is there isn't really you know, this water is nice and clean, but the data here that you would get out of it's kind of muddied together. There, There is no pulling out the real opens out of this. It's, it's all together. Apple has this mask. It's all come off their IPs with their specific refer. You're not going to get any data out of this at all. Um, and you're going to run into people who say they have a magic way to do this. Those people are full of beans. It's, it's an arms race kind of thing. They might have found some sort of hack work around to get through to that data today. Maybe they put some code in an email that triggers uh, a load in a way that Apple wasn't expecting originally. Um, but by doing that, they're not making any friends with ISPs. And those are all short-term successes that, that Apple and others, when they find stuff like that, they will block it. So it, it's not, again, trying to get around this to get at the real opens is not a long-term path to success in, in, no matter what. So now what, what then, um, what do you do? What do you look at instead if you're trying to do the right thing to keep a good sending reputation and keep solid inbox placement? Obviously the, the starter thing here for me, um, obvious <laughs> from, from a deliverability and engagement perspective is clicks. Today, you know, I, I, again, not necessarily looking at you know, source IP, but looking at if somebody's interacting with the message, if they're clicking through and you're able to weed out the potential security click, botnet clicks, um, which you know most platforms should be able to do or need to do if they're not doing it today. Um, those clicks are still going to be general, generally correlating to people who are interacting with messages. Um, the problem is, from a marketer's perspective, is those numbers are a lot lower than than opens. Uh, but that's what's there, and that's what you're left with. Um, the other things I wanted to highlight here is be risk averse, and what I mean by that is. Um, there's sort of a class of marketer that is just looking for how close can they get to the line? What can they get away with up to right to the very edge? And if like if they went one inch further, they would suddenly be in trouble. They'd get blocked or they go to the spam folder. 
this is an example, this whole thing with Apple MPP is an example of that line coming closer to you. There, there is no get as close to the edge as you can. When we talk about the negative indicators as we have and will continue to talk about, you risk fumbling across that line and running into problems, running into issues from those negative indicators when you've lost the ability to sort of easily get back over the line by boosting engagement. In other words, we've, to some degree, marketers have lost the opportunity to get that positive engagement feedback. And so you could stumble into a deliverability issue that's gonna be a lot harder to fix today, tomorrow, next week than it was a year ago. And that's because of Apple MPP. Um, other things to be wary of too, we'll talk about here, um, you know, reputation sharing, you know, there's some scenarios where you have to do it. You have to sh share IP addresses and stuff like that. Um, but also be wary of it because now more than ever, <clears throat> again, robbed of that opportunity to look at engagement through the lenses of, of open tracking, it can be tougher to resolve an issue. It might even be tougher to monitor for some types of issues. Um, and that also leads toward why domain reputation is so important. Um, and those negative indicators that are associated with that. Yeah, and um, I said it before, those negative indicators are really, really, really important um, to us, obviously, right? Because it really tells us that, yes, that email is not really wanted or desired uh, by our users. But um, I believe that is also important um, for the senders in the absence of, you know, the, the other positive signals we think uh, we are used to. Um, and there are others, or, or there are some con more concrete negative signals. Um, you know, certainly subscribe to the feedback loop uh, if you can, or some other feeds you can get from uh, mailbox providers. Uh, implement um, unsubscribe, make it very easy for users to unsubscribe and listen to it, um, and respect it. Um, ideally implement RFC 8058, that is the uh, one-click unsubscribe. On the receiving side, we really, really love it. Uh, Microsoft, Google, us, we have uh, affordances, UI right within our applications. If we trust your email, that's where reputation, domain reputation comes into play again. We will display that to our users, make it very easy to unsubscribe. Um, I know that Google and us, we also really try to hold the hand of our users to really guide them to the best option. Um, for example, if you do uh, say this is spam in Gmail or in our UI, and we think that sender is kind of trustworthy and there is a one-click unsubscribe ability available, we would actually nudge the user toward the unsubscribe um, flow and not have uh, our users ding your reputation with a market spam um, action. Other things you could be doing, you can actually listen to replies. <laughs> Uh, I know that's not really a thing in the industry. Maybe it should be. I don't know. El, what do you think? Yeah, that's sort of the the last positive indicator standing, right? Actually, getting to sign a sign of life out of subscribers, whether it be with direct interaction in uh, asking for responses, or at least tracking clicks, and then, like you said, the negative indicators too, right? All of the usual stuff. It's not new from a deliverability perspective, um, and it mostly aligns to what the ISP is seeing. There, even even in places where it might be slightly different it's still good to look at negative data points. What are the list segments or data segments with the highest unsub rates, the highest bounce rates, you know, the highest uh, FBL complaint rates, any, anything you could do to correlate those negative indicators back to specific processes or practices um, to get that data down, to make sure you're doing everything right, get bad data out of the way, that's gonna help to improve deliverability success. Now let's talk about sharing. Um, we talked a lot about negative uh, signals and God, I hate needles. So I really do not like this slide and it's my own fault because it's my clip art. Uh, but think about negative signals caused by other people sharing your IP address or domain. Now in an IP sharing scenario, you know, if you, you send significantly less than say 100,000 messages a month, you really have no choice but to be in a shared IP. <clears throat> Excuse me. So there's really, um, there, there's in that scenario, your provider has to be on the ball to help monitor for shared reputation issues to make sure that everybody engaging in sending mail from those IPs is engaged in best practices. Um, and that, that includes you too, right? You can't send 
junky stuff from a shared IP and not expect it to negatively impact others. There, that happens. It happens every day. But so you know, that's the concept of sort of blended IP reputation. Domain reputation is a little bit uh, uh, tougher, a little bit more icky and squicky to deal with, um, especially at Gmail. Just you know, um, Marcel talked about a, a lot about the Yahoo perspective, but. I, you know, I have run into problems delivering mail to Gmail because of shared domain reputation issues. If you have a bunch of clients in a shared pool, it, you know, it starts out as a shared IP pool, but it, it can end up being a domain reputation problem. They have a, you know, if, if they all have a shared DKIM domain or if they have a shared uh, SPF return path domain, which is what happened in my case, and somebody does something bad, they're sending millions of messages with very high complaint rates, the mail is very clearly unwanted, um, you can end up blocked or having other problems solely because you share a domain with someone else and not really related to the IP address. You can put that same mail on a different IP address, it's still going to have the same problems. And that's why, just to sort of touch on, to put the cherry on top of the, the statement that Marcel's been making all throughout, that's why your own domain reputation is so important. It should be you, and you need to get it right, and it shouldn't be shared. You know, again, there, from, from the IP address perspective, there can be reasons you have to share IPs that makes total sense. But domains, your best practice, your best chance of success is not to share domain reputation. Yeah, it's kind of like in real life, right? If you surround yourself with, uh, you know, weird people, um, you know, that reputation will rub off, I guess. Um, and you will be judged by um, how you appear with them, with them in, in public as well. Um, but even above and beyond just uh, deliverability and, and, and engagement tracking and all of these things, <clears throat> just getting into the inbox, why is uh, um, domain reputation and all these positive signals on our side or you consuming uh, those negative signals important? Um, we're, there, there are more and more uh, new and not so new uh, emerging features which we are introducing on the mailbox provider side or in email applications. Um, you know, like like cards in our inboxes or Gmail inboxes, we all have seen this on the top of the promo tab, for example, where we basically extract relevant information from the email and just show it to our users in a different, more relevant, actionable way. Um, there are certainly others, AMP for email, right? Highly dynamic and interactive emails. Um, there's BIMI out there, and all of them uh, are really features where we want to make sure that our users can trust uh, these emails, those brands, that content. Um, so we need more positive signals, and we really need to uh, know who we are, that we can actually also be sure and trust you that. We can enable those um, features. That's why domain reputation is really, really important. And maybe um, we should be working on even, you know, more features and functionality beyond that, and should collaborate on uh, how can we share back some of the positive uh, engagement signals with you. Maybe um, that's an idea. But even above and beyond that. And if you want to move on to the next slide, even above and beyond that, right? I always like to uh, compare things to the car industry because I'm a car nut, but um, you, you have similar similar ideas there, right? Everybody's competing, like all these car manufacturers and brands are competing with, the, with each other, but there are certain realities, either they have to because of laws or because of uh, economic benefits where they collaborate together, they work together on uh, creating new technology or maybe even sharing technology. And, you know, obviously there are also some other companies supporting these brands um, uh, when it comes to certain technology and they also get money for it, you know, be it uh, security or safety technology like ABS and every car, you know, has to have one nowadays. Uh, and things like that, because at the end of the day, we all share the same roads in a way, right? You know, it's a, it's an old cliche, the internet highway is also shared by everybody else, uh, you know, the bad guys and the good guys. So we really need to work together on hopefully coming up with even more uh, standards which can help us to get the wanted email into our user's mailbox and to keep uh, the crap out. And 
Um, just sharing an idea which we um, have discussed that you know one of the recent uh, mark uh, conferences and that's the idea because we talked about uh, not having a signal when you send us an email right we don't really know who we are when you first show up at our doorstep so to speak uh, so to speak um, but maybe if you would know who we are right maybe if we would know um, that our users actually ask for the email maybe if it would have a verifiable way of actually understanding consent or verifying consent on both sides right in a way implementing or developing or coming up with like OAuth two for email subscriptions um that could be really great because it's like instead of the user giving you an email address in the free form field, or you just collect your email addresses, um, which is obviously not great from other sources, uh, or just assume you have consent, right? Let the user sign into their account. Um, and by doing that, they authenticate, you know, you can be sure that this actually is the user who they claim they are. You get the correct email address, right? You don't need to verify anything anymore. Um, you can document and collect consent and we can do this on both sides. You have it, we have it on our side. Um, once you start sending with <clears throat> that key, so to speak, uh, we can verify the sender and you get in a way uh, guaranteed inboxing as long as that key is valid. Um, that would be fantastic in my opinion. And, um, but at the very least, if you don't do that, um, no, authenticate your email. That's the key there, right? If you authenticate your emails, they're able to tell who you are, see what you do, and understand what you do, and the mail's not getting complained about. In other words, you're not getting an excess of those negative indicators, then your reputation is going to be good. Maybe even all of that, that, my friend. <laughs> It's pretty much it. Um, we'll have this. Uh, we'll share this with folks. Whoever wants it, there's links here at the end to more information from Yahoo, uh, my blog, my work stuff there with Kickbox. Um, and if you want to learn more about Apple MPP, here's links to more stuff here. How to track uh, refers and and look at how to measure that to see what's going on. Uh, I had a very interesting thing in one of these uh, industry Slack things this morning where somebody was dealing with a marketing manager who denied the existence existence of Apple MPP. He just said. No, those those that's bad with this new opens. It must not be legitimate, um, and that's unfortunately not true. A Apple MPP is clearly inflating open counts, so maybe some of this data can help. Um, and finally, there, there's a good link from uh, uh, Chad White at Oracle uh, who put together um, some things to think about, uh, things you can still track and why, even in, even in the this new realm, this new era of Apple MPP. So that's worth checking out as well. I think now we should have time for questions. Oh my God, thank you very much. This was a very interesting session and we do have a long list of questions here. Um, so even if you answered already a few of those questions in that list, there are some of them and uh, I would love to read them out loud. Let me think about what to start with. There. I just start with the with the first one and then go down the list. Um, there is a question from Will Boyd. So uh, first to the to the attendees, if someone wants to ask his question directly, please raise hand, and uh, you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Just let me know when you unraise your hand. Um, there is a question from Will Boyd. Do you have any sense of if there is a significant significant difference between how long mailbox providers store positive versus negative signals? Like, do positive signals hang around longer than negatives? Marcel, maybe it's a question to you first, if you are coming from MVP directly. I cannot answer that. So we, we also have to understand that um, at least you know the 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 larger mailbox providers we use a lot of ml um machine learning and you know we apply models at various stages um of the, you know, the email life cycle so to speak and um you know that really these models look at data probably differently depending on um 
how they work. So I, I, the, the short answer to that question is, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Al, anything to add? Something from your experience? Uh, there was yeah, a I'm question sure alongside right. to that. Do you know what are the the signals that Gmail is lo looking at in terms of log uh, negative and positive ones? So, you know, to the point about dates, I think, you know, Marcel's right about, um, you know, nobody's going to publish a line and say, follow this, because anytime you say it's exactly 30 days, then uh, somebody's going to send good for 31 days and say, why isn't it fixed immediately? Um, so keep in mind that a good starting point for making improvements is looking at a third rolling 30 day window of statistics. Like Marcel said, there's a lot of machine uh, learning involved. And so it's not always that simple. And there's kind of a correlation uh, a mild correlation, but one nonetheless between best practices and how quickly you can clean it up. You know, if if your average Joe mostly doing things right, you know, 30-ish days of good activity probably is going to help you positively. Um, if you're really on the edge of of doing bad things, or you were doing bad things, and it's and it's taking you a long time to sort of clean up the data you're sending, it's going to take a lot longer to resolve the deliverability issue as well. So I would say, what does that mean? I mean, start from 30 days, but assume that it's going to vary based on um, possible indicators that you don't necessarily always see. Like you, then the second part of the question is, what are the negative indicators they're looking at, right? And that's, um, you know, there's the whole matrix of, you know, think of any think of anything that you know is an indication of uh, a bad list or uh, a list that, uh, that nobody cares about, that nobody cares about your content, right? So that could be as measured from the ISP side. Think about, you know, low opens, low clicks. Again, uh, measured by the, the, the mailbox provider, not through open tracking by the sending platform. But then also the, the high negative things like high bounce rates, high complaint rates, um, you know, low click rates, all of, all of that stuff, anything that correlates to mail that either isn't cared about or isn't wanted. Oh, and the last bit there, right, is dragging the mail out of the spam folder, right? That's uh, it sort of is called TINs, that this is not spam click, right? If, you're, if, if an ISP is putting your mail in the spam folder and nobody's pulling it back out, the ISP thinks that mail is exactly where it's supposed to be in the spam folder. These are good points, and for me, that's the that's the one major outcome of that's uh, out of that webinar. Um, look at the negative signals. I mean, in email marketing, everyone is looking for performance and increasing the performance, so everyone thinks look at the positive ones. But you both mentioned look at the ne negative ones because they can harm and destroy your um, domain reputation. There is a question from Ron Kellerman. And Ron would love to ask his question your, uh, by himself. Ron, try to unmute yourself and ask your question. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Al. Hi, Marcel. Thank you for a great webinar. Um, Bimi, where are we? I wanted to know, I know we've, we've been dealing with you, Marcel, in the past regarding Bimi. Uh, we're following what's happening with Yahoo, we're following what's happening with Gmail. Obviously, there are different directions. With Gmail, you need DigiCert. Microsoft, no one knows what the hell is going on. So, do you guys, do you have any insights on, on, on what's happening in sort of industry-wide? Um, I cannot speak on behalf of the, uh, the BIMI working group, obviously. Um, but just from our perspective, BIMI is out there. BIMI is real. <clears throat> we see, you know, a steady uh, curve or, you know, uh, adoption, very positive. Um, we just have a different philosophy than, than Gmail. And who knows, maybe Gmail will change theirs as well. Uh, we just want to make it very accessible. That's why we do not acquire VMC, because we realize there are certain hurdles you have to go through as a brand, and not every brand can afford that. Um, and that's why to us, domain reputation or real reputation is actually very, very important, right? <clears throat> and we have some, we realize we have some smaller senders who say, oh, I'm not sending enough and how, how many emails do I need to send? And I think a very important answer here is your reputation is not necessarily a function of how many emails you send or there's no, oh, you need to send 100 emails and then you're good, right? Reputation, you can achieve positive reputation by, you know, sending just a few emails, but if our users in the, engage with it, you have a positive reputation. It's just, it's just a matter of 
uh, machine learning models, right? The more data they have, obviously, you know, they faster or the better they can make certain decisions. But yeah, so I, I think they use it to stay, so just continue to use it. Marcel, if I, if I can just ask, I mean, at, at the time we, I think it was a year or more than a year ago that we talked about it and, and you, you, you were saying that it is down to ultimately a quantity that you, you, you would be able to see, but are there any, are there any indicators as far as Yahoo is concerned, what will, you know, bearing in mind the reputation is good, but um, I need to know what I can go back to my clients. To, to talk about what yeah, so it, that one I don't want to spend too much time really because I think we have other questions as well but if you go to our postmaster page sendersyahoo.com there's a section about bimi all of our requirements and there's also a link you can or an email address you can reach out to um, if if you have problems if you think you know bimi logo should be shown but it's not and then we help you and explain you know why it's not shown or what you need to do okay Thank you. Uh, and the last thing I'll put there is uh, every few months I post an update on spam resource that's current industry state of BME. Just shows you which ISPs have implemented it, which ones are talking about it. I don't have any secret insights, so it's all based on what's published info. You can go on. And in fact, today's uh, blog post on spam resource was about BME or how to sort of fake it at Gmail when you don't quite have a VMC in place yet. Um, so that's something to, to watch for more info, right? The, the providers supporting it today are, you know, Yahoo, Gmail, um, Fastmail, and then, you know, Comcast and Cessna are supposedly on the considering it lists. Um, and I haven't seen any significant change there, and I've seen nothing to say that Microsoft has decided to join the party yet. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Ron. Um, I've got a question from Mary Son, which is uh, quite interesting. As you've mentioned it, Marcel, uh, in particular, that unsubscribe links should work and should be implemented and should be visible. Um, does one-click unsubscribe result in unintentional unsubs by security features that click through all uh, click through on all URLs? Oh, you're nodding. Uh, you, you, you're agreeing to that. So yeah. Feel free to answer. We have to, we have to differentiate between you know one click unsubscribe as described by RFC 8058, right? So when you read through that, it requires you to put basically two or leverage list unsubscribe headers and put in additional information into the list unsubscribe header. If you just if somebody just follows that link, basically just uh, generates a get request, nothing should happen on the other side because it should be a post request and you require to actually uh, post a uh, a variable or you know some additional content in there so that's is that is addressing the security stuff uh when you talk about the unsubscribe links within the body um yes some uh, security software can follow it uh, and some b2b security software actually does that um you can mitigate that on your landing page by basically asking users to click a button or things like that personally i do not like that um, i prefer the one click unsubscribe functionality within the header. Also, users are more trained to not necessarily click these unsubscribe links because there's no additional layer of protection on our side um, because anybody can put an unsubscribe link in there. Um, so ideally, follow RFC 8058. We, we love that. Yeah, let's so unsub post there is key, right? If you if you have a legacy single click unsub, yes, you're going to get false unsubs, and that needs to become a two click unsub. It's I agree, it's it's a much less slick uh, end user experience, but otherwise, unless you really are on top of denoting bot clicks, you're going to have problems. And then even then, under the U.S. law, it gets really itchy. You're like, what is it? When is it okay to ignore that unsub click because you think it's a bot? And I don't want to be the one that ends up in court getting in trouble over it. Right, thank you very much. Um, we are nearly at the top of the hour. Al and Marcel, do you still have some time to answer one or two additional questions or shall we send them afterwards to you? Because it's a long list to be very honest. Um, and you reach out to the folks and answer them pick, directly. Pick the good ones. Pick the good sure. ones. What is a good one? To me, all of them are good, but maybe in terms of uh, building up domain reputation, is there any advice from you um, how volume should be managed while ramping up 
um, a new domain and building up a reputation. Any recommendations from you guys there? Yeah, it, it's tougher. Um, you know, with IP warming, there are many guides out there that cover it with specific volume recommendations. And it varies greatly, but you know, mostly, most of them are from very smart people. And so there's different ways to sort of come to this, this similar conclusion. There's less guidance out there for the domain reputation. And I don't really necessarily have a good feel of what is an exact number of here's how you limit your volume in the same way to do IP reputation. I, I would still say try to try to warm that domain, still try to do your first few weeks of send slower and smaller and build it up. I'm not sure it's as exactly necessary to the same degree as IP warming. Um, so it's, I apologize, it's a little bit of a hand wavy answer that I, I'm, I'm working on better understanding myself. Right, and maybe related to that, does sending frequency matter for a good reputation, e.g. regular send or fluctuation in sending volume on a weekly basis? Is that something that matters for you as a mailbox provider, Marcel, that influences the reputation? It matters in so far that, like I said before, the more data we have or the more data the machine has to make decisions, the better, right? So if you're not sending a lot or sending very infrequently, it just takes longer for you uh, to build up reputation. Right. Um, of course, there are some challenges out there for you know certain senders who you know used to send spikes that might throw off machines. Um, right. Okay. I think we will collect and send the the, the questions uh, through to you. Thank you very much, Mike. I think ah oh, yeah, there you are. Um, now it's your turn. Yeah, um, to sum up the webinar today, I would like to share some key facts we already received. Um, the first one we got is um, do not share your domain reputation, as you mentioned also in the webinar. Um, another one is sending bad stuff from a shared domain impacts others sending from the same domain. And I think we already received another one. Um, in the context of domain reputation, we strongly look for negative signals. And um, I think that should be the best key facts or that should be enough for today. And uh, thank you, Al, and thank you, Marcel, for sharing your knowledge with us today. And of course, your time. And we have so many questions so far. I think we will share them with you and um, we will share the answers, of course, with you attendees too and um, yeah as you can see we have further and upcoming webinars during the year so check them out and we'll just up for the the next webinars and uh, thank you attendees for your time of course and thank you again El and Marcel and thank you Sebastian <laughs> thank you have a nice day bye cheers thank you